Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Nick Horner. I am the curator and producer of Porch Stomp, and we are excited to be uh, starting some really wonderful arts and culture talks with our new series, uh, Pop-Up Folk, with generous support from the Brooklyn Arts Council. Uh, we are very excited to have some wonderful folks today uh, to talk about the the invisibility of uh, indigenous roots in the blues and in Western music. And um, we're gonna be showing a little bit of a documentary and have many more things to say. Uh, before we go any further, I really have to thank uh, Jason Vitelli with uh, Music for Multimedia. He is the man behind the curtain making today's programming look and sound so good. So thank you, Jason. Uh, hopefully we'll see a little flash of uh, his uh, business card, virtual business card, come up at the end of the program today. And uh, before we go any further, um, let me just do one introduction, which I'm so excited to make. Uh, Dan Grigsby uh, is a great friend who I met through uh, IAR uh, way back in the day of maybe 2017. Um, incredible engineer and, and super generous guy. Uh, we had uh, the good fortune of sort of hitting it off and developing a friendship. And in that friendship, I found out about uh, his uh, his path to become an ethnomusicologist and um, uh, studies in indigenous cultures, and um, which actually led to where we are today and um, a documentary we're about to show. So, Dan, hello. Hi, Hi Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, can, can you do us a favor and just start off by telling us a little bit about what we're about to watch? Yeah, um, I am um, a, a, a late, I'm a late bloomer. So uh, uh, in, in, in my uh, later years, I decided to go to graduate school and obtain a graduate degree. And I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I mean, I spent my whole life in the music industry as a recording engineer and a producer and a mixer. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, got some uh, platinum and gold records under my belt and so forth, blessed with those. Um, but I was always, always, when listening to music, always very interested in um, cultural origins and um, uh, things that music shared and why they shared them. Um, not from the marketing standpoint, but from a, a cultural standpoint. What people often confuse uh, when they talk about ethnomusicologist and musicologist, is the fact that a musicologist is more um, focused, looks at everything through the, a lens of music theory. And ethnomusicologist is looking uh, through the lens of um, uh, culture and uh, uh, ethnicity, you know, the, what cultures may share uh, um, directly or indirectly. And that that came to me, I guess, through birth because my father um, was a Native American uh, on his mother's side. And um, Blackfoot is the nation that we are uh, uh, members of, or I shouldn't say members because I'm not card, card carrying, um, but um, our ancestry is there, um, which is for some folks, if they're not sure, that's Northern Montana and Alberta, Canada. The Blackfoot and the Blackfeet are really the same for all intensive purposes. Um, my mother was Italian, American, my father Native American, so it made Columbus Day very interesting in my house. But uh, it just sort of fueled my, my interest and my desire to figure the ethnic things that we have in common, as opposed to uh, the things that separate us. And what a better way to do that than, uh, than through the arts and specifically music, because that's been my background. That's where I've worked. I've always been a folk and blues fan. Um, as I worked my way through the music industry, I, I met lots of indigenous musicians that I was unaware uh, were, were native. And I'm sure the public was unaware that they were native. And what we all shared that we talked about was either folk music or blues. So I thought, wow, what uh, an interesting study this would be to see if indeed this connection 
is um, older than just contemporary music. And that's what began my research and began looking into things. And that's when I decided that's what I want to do my, my thesis on in grad school. I want to uh, look at, look at the, the blues through uh, uh, and a native, a na any Native American uh, connection, contribution. Boy, was I surprised. There is so much. And of course, a lot of it is the fact that we have so much in common with African Americans in that we were both uh, victims of colonialism and uh, oppression. Uh, I'm not gonna turn this on. I don't have a soapbox tonight. Don't worry, don't, be, don't change that channel. I left the soapbox home. I am home, I left the soapbox in the other room. Um, but there's a great deal that we, that we have in common, which, which then again made me uh, look into and research things about uh, how certain musics develop um, because of the um, emotional impact and the uh, chemical makeup that emotions create. You know, what people don't realize, when you feel something, your, 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 your brain chemistry changes. Uh, there's a great book by Daniel Levinson, who was a... Uh, uh, mm -hmm actually a, a recording engineer, but now he's, he's, he has a PhD in um, um, psychology and neurosci neuroscience. And he wrote a book called, This Is Your Brain on Music. Um, music is a very powerful tool. So why wouldn't people who felt like they had no other means of communication or no other means of exp expressing themselves that they could uh, were allowed to do, um, they would find a way. People will find a way through the arts, through music, to communicate. You know, um, and uh, there's a historical component to this whole thing. Uh, you know, uh, growing up, when my indigenous relatives and friends would talk about history, it is so not what is written in our history books that we uh, are given to learn when we grew up here in this country in schools. Um, I'm not criticizing as much, but I think that it would be so much more important to our collective culture to, uh, to know the real truths, you know, to know everyone's real history. Um, Beautiful. So that's what got me running, you know, uh, and um, the path found my feet and led me to a, a bunch of people who were kindred spirits and uh, not just native people like my dear friend Thea, but also uh, Valerie, uh, who for all these years just lived a few apartments away from me in, in my same building. Um, actually, before I met you, Valerie, I used to, used to think of you as the bird lady. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could fly, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> not only do we share gardening in, in common but we also uh, like music and the, her music seems to come often from songbirds and she has birds in her apartment and you know, whenever we i remember we would find like birds that fell out of their nests it's like what do we do call the bird lady call the bird lady uh, oh. and then thea i met uh doing doing through doing this documentary um which has only just begun. What we're going to see tonight is nowhere near what the finished product is going to be. Uh, it's just a short edited teaser, if you will, to use the terminology of the, uh, the industry. Um, and uh, COVID put a stop to a lot of the things we had planned. We, uh, I, at least that I was planning. I might, this might be a surprise to, to Thea and, and and to uh, Valerie, but I picked out a group of people that I thought um, nations that were nearby would make the the travel easy for us. I mean, among them would be the Seneca and the Pueblo people in the Four Corners area, uh, Lakota, uh, very good friends, and was in a band called Ghost Horse with uh, mm -hmm. Ghost Horse, who is uh, an activist and uh, for indigenous people. He actually was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize a few years back, but uh, didn't get it. Um, I, my, my people's, I was nominated for Grammy Awards, but I never won. People say, oh, it's great to be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to win. Um, but the Lakota, the Cree, because they're sort of uh, relatives to uh, my people, the, the, the Blackfoot. Wampanoag, because that's the, uh, the people that Thea comes from. 
Uh, and then uh, along with the East Coast in uh, New England area, uh, Pequot and uh, Mohegan. Um, and uh, the Chicks Chicksaw, Chickasaw, I'd love to see because the man who is credited with being the father of the Mississippi Delta Blues, Charlie Patton, only one picture exists of this man, was forever hmm. thought to be African-American, solely African-American. Uh, and it turns out he's, he's a, um, a Chickasaw Indian. Right. Um, a lot of the peoples in Louisiana and so forth, the Native peoples are, are a mix of mixed race, Native American and African American. We seem to have shared this culture and this history uh, for a very, very long time. And I really wanted to spotlight that. I really wanted to focus that. Um, I, want, I, I also feel as if with the recent Black Lives Matters movement, there have been some uh, things um, that have changed in, in Indian country as well. I think in the legislative areas of local and uh, state and federal governments, um, we're seeing a little more sensitivity to things of race and so forth. Um, but you really don't get any true history about indigenous people. Uh, we suffer from what we call invisibility. We suffer from memorializing, you know, um, we're a if you put a statue up for somebody, they're probably gone, right? Uh, but we're still yeah. here. Um, and then uh, Alaska, there's an amazing blues guitarist, an indigenous man up there, lives in, in uh, Husala, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, Mark Brown and the blues crew, um, who has a really interesting story. Uh, so, you know, I, I found a whole bunch of people a whole community of musicians and artistic people who um, were kind of aware of what it was I was studying. And right when I started this, this film came out called Rumble, The Indians Who Rock mm -hmm. the World. And when it first came out, I went to see it, of course. And I, I was so depressed. I left the film and I called my advisor at the State, at state University of, of, of New York. And I said, they, my, my thunder has been stolen. It's done. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. They're adding credence to your thesis. You're not alone. You know? Mm -hmm. And of course, that energized me even more. But, uh, yeah. um, well, I, I would love just so we can get the folks at home into this, I would love for us to, to play a little bit of this documentary. Yeah. That's okay. okay. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, and does oh, sorry. Valerie and uh, do? I'm sorry, Nick. <laughs> this is your show. I gotta stop. No, go ahead. <laughs> it's so funny because I'm like a record producer, so I was like, I'm always like, hold it, wait, wait, you can do that a little better. Yeah. Um, does, does Valerie and Thea want to say a little something about the work that? We're, that oh we're yeah, sure. Before, before we start, or um, I don't. I, I I would actually just you know like for for you to play it, you know, before I before we speak about it. I think that would be nice. Um, um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Thea? That sounds good. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, and I just wanna invite the folks at home uh, to please feel free to comment if you have any questions. Um, uh, they are, this is through Restream, so we are actually being fed some of those questions. So if there are things that we think are gonna generate some great conversation, we will respond to them. Our buddy Jason is gonna be hanging them up on the screen uh, after we watch the uh, uh, documentary clip. So, yep, Jason, whenever you're ready. No. My name is Frank Manusen, uh, and uh, my native name is Nkusi Hlomi. Uh, I'm half uh, Muscogee and uh, assorted Indian, all the way down to the Andes. I'm Alison Akuchuk Warden. Oh, there's uh, People also call me Aku. I am Inupiaq. I was born and raised in Fairbanks. 
Uh, my people, I'm a tribal member of the native village of Kaktovik, which is an island in Alaska in the Arctic Ocean, about 90 miles west of the Canadian Arctic border. My name is Thea Hopkins, and I'm a member of the Aquino Wampanoag tribe of Mothers Vineyard, and I'm a performing songwriter. I'm Martha Redbone. I'm a singer, songwriter, and composer, and I am Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, and African American. I grew up in Kentucky and New York City, in Brooklyn. My ancestors came from Oklahoma. We were originally from Appalachia, part of the Trail of Tears, and then came back. It's uh, the East Coast, Eastern Woodland story, pretty much. Most of my family was living down south before the time of uh, the Trail of Tears. Both sides are related uh, to the Muscogee group. Uh, my mother's mother's family, Seminole Creek, my dad's family, Muscogee Creek. And uh, so I learned the language as a child, some of it, and then later on I, I started studying it again to be reconnected. I describe my music as Red Roots Americana. When I was younger I played violin and viola, but I, I got away from that and, you know, fell in love with the guitars. I loved music my whole life. That was the thing. I grew up in a musical family and, uh, and I was around music since uh, I was a very tiny child. And my interests were very eclectic. I work in many mediums. One of them is, is, is music, and it's primarily hip-hop. I rap as the animals, so I'll rap as a polar bear or a bowhead whale or possibly a, a caribou. My main instrument is my voice indeed, but I also play our percussion. A um, little bit of guitar and really terrible banjo <laughs> and, and piano. I would say my very first influence would be my dad, who is a really wonderful singer. My dad is um, African American and Lumbee from North Carolina. My grandfather attended the Carlisle School. And so what I was taught when I was a little girl, you know, um, at the dinner table, when I would ask my mother, what, what is it? What does that mean we're Indian? And she would say, we're a conquered people. My dad told me simply, I was Indian before it was cool to be Indian. One of the songs I wrote was called Jesus is on the Wire. And um, Peter, Paul, and Mary discovered the song and um, recorded it. And, um, you know, it's considered one of their latest signature songs. It's a song that I wrote about Matthew Shepard. The beat makers that I collaborate with sample traditional sounds from my people in the spirit of hip-hop. When I uh, first started writing songs, I um, made a conscious decision to tell stories about my life. Um, and then I realized as an independent artist, if my record ends up, if the music that I make ends up halfway around the world on someone's desk, what do I want people to know just from looking at the cover? One of the things was that, well, this record comes from, comes from America. I'm a woman of color from America. I'm also um, black and indigenous from America. And what does that mean? On my most recent album, I wrote a song about my great, great aunt, Tamsin Weeks, who is an Aquinnah Wampanoag medicine woman who was known throughout New England for her cures and remedies, and people would come from all over New England. I want all of this to be part of, part of what I'm offering to Native culture, uh, and also non-Native if they're interested, you know, because um, it's important to me. Camps and weeks, walks alone, gathering leaves and twigs. She'll dry them in the sun as the day birds sing. Camps and weeks, fevered brows, broken hearts. Camps and weeks, no woes, what you need when life falls apart. No, oh, oh, it's what you need when life falls apart. 
know is what you need when life falls apart. There's so many different ways of thinking about decolonization. Um, a lot of people think, oh, land, land acknowledgments. And that, that can be a very important first step on a, on a process and a, and a journey for an institution or people to think about what decolonization might encompass. So we're the only racial group on the planet that has to prove our race. Don't go around telling people you're native. I felt a sense of human responsibility to educate because no one's been taught the truth. Our work is way commercially viable in, because there's a hunger within non-indigenous populations to, to learn. The kind of only remaining kind of Traces of my dad were um, a piano and an old stereo console. I, I find uh, James Brown's album and, and I'm playing it and, you know, and I'm like dancing and, you know, in the living room and stuff. And my mom's like looking at me and, you know, I'm being, I'm hamming it up and being silly and stuff. And, um, and I'm singing, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And my mom says, you know, is that all you are? You're, you're black and you're proud? Is that, well, is that the only thing you're proud of? Don't I count for something? And she said, don't participate in the genocide of your own people. Don't erase us. Do you think Native people were involved in the formation of the Blues? Absolutely. Without a smidgen of a doubt. Not one iota of doubt. For instance, if you listen to Eastern Woodland songs and you listen to Southern Woodland songs, we're talking about uh, songs that range all the way from the Megama all the way down to uh, Oklahoma, from the border of Canada, the, between the Mississippi and the Atlantic, that whole region. You're going to hear stomp songs. And these stomp songs are thousands of years old. Most of them don't even have words. They have vocables because the, the languages have gone extinct. And so the melodies and the rhythms survive. Remember, there were 7,000 African ex-slaves that were living among the Muscogee people alone. So 7,000 people that were integrated into our society in what we call Lusti Italwa, the black towns. These people learned the language, they learned the culture, they learned the food. We learned from them. We learned patchwork. We learned uh, language from them. Many of them became ambassadors. Uh, they became chiefs, they intermarried. There was a lot of that. Uh, Smokey Robinson is one of ours. Being African American and, and Native American, that connection of those two peoples who were brought together, you know, from the very beginning of transatlantic slavery, those two musics would not be what we call the blues today had it not been for the combination of both of those people. Live to the in the mountain to see the world riches to gain oh when I return no earthly treasures could ease this heart so full of pain and they're so high upon that mountain neat that little mountain 
old clay Oh, the girl that I return to marry So still among the flowers that lay Way up, 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 I lay aside my earthly gain. Oh, but I'll not end. Be the man with riches, undone in sorrow. I'll remain undone in sorrow. I'll remain undone in sorrow. I'll So, if that's not the blues, I don't know what is. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. I was, I'm just going to do this because, you know, if this were a film festival, you know, this is the part where everyone would be cheering wildly. So <laughs> can't, can't really hear that. We're, we're doing the best we can in the digital world. Um, wow. I mean, a lot of powerful things were addressed in that. But before I, I kick off with, you know, me nerding out about the things I was hearing, Valerie and, and Thea, do you have any anything you'd like to say about this? It's wonderful to, I, I haven't seen any of the documentary yet. So it's wonderful to see a, a portion of it tonight. So, yeah. Uh, you know, Thea's song is, is not that short. Um, I, I warned you. Uh, I edited it from uh, Valerie's full-length version, uh, so it could be shorter for a teaser. And I tried to keep it musical, so I put that little that little fade thing. That I, saw, little, 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 I <laughs> saw this box. Um, so you did a great job, Dan. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't blame Valerie for the edit. I did. <laughs> By the way, I, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry, Nick, I'm, I have my yeah. my mouth, um, that uh, just recently the uh, most latest um, Great American Songwriting Contest, Thea Hopkins won. She uh, won uh, the grand prize for best song. So um, yeah, congratulations to, to my dear Thanks. friend, Thea. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, uh, Paula Stanley, by the way, sends some clapping emojis our way. So thank you, Paula, for coming in. Um, I, you know, Dan, I have to say the one thing that struck me 
Um, well, there were a couple things that, that struck me this time watching through that, that uh, teaser. Um, one of which is actually something that we had talked about before, which was this idea of the swing that, that comes from, from the sound of the shaker, which is, uh, you know, I studied with a great uh, jazz drummer, uh, Phil Haynes, and I just remember in our, like, you know, my introduction to jazz was the swing, you know, and the idea of groove. And um, it's, I mean, it's amazing hearing that interplay and realizing it's like, wow, you really do get that. And but and then on top of that, Frank talks about the vocables as an idea of like this, you know, we think of Louis Armstrong as the, sort of the birth of scat, but that's just because it was the first thing that was recorded. There really is like a super strong heritage in jazz, certainly, but then obviously jazz is roots of the blues and, and you hear a lot of this stuff. I'm curious, are there, are there other uh, musical homages, you know, as we hear in like present day that, that we might not be aware of, you know, like you think obviously it, pretty much everything we hear in, West, in Western pop music certainly is a derivative of the blues. You know, I'm, I'm curious if you might weigh in on that and Valerie or, or Thea, it, you know, feel yeah, free. I, I think it's important though to note that this, uh, entire project is not about taking credit or taking um, m m diminishing uh, contributions by any other uh, um, uh, race, certainly not African Americans. What it's about is um, uh, bringing those contributions that were otherwise invisible to 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 the forefront. So I think that's important. You know, mm -hmm. I, I one time did as a a, um, a performance art piece. Um, there was a projection screen in front of a, a, a an audience, a, a gathered audience, and um, there were um, uh, there were two small, very zoomed in circular photos, and one was um, a mass grave. And um, with exposed uh, bodies, horrific. And um, the other was um, what most of us uh, associate with uh, the, uh, please forgive me, the Hitler mustache. And uh, everyone made reference to the, uh, the horrible, horrible Holocaust of World War II. What freaked everybody out is when I zoomed out those circles and it opened up, the mass graves were at Wounded Knee and were the victims of the United States government. And the mustache was Charlie Chaplin. So the point here is that our history books, what we're taught really directs us in very powerful ways. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone but it really alters our thinking when we grow up and we become involved in politics, humanity, culture, education, art, whatever it is, whatever path we take, we carry this stuff with us. So it's just so important that we try to get real history and real truths out, not to take anything away or diminish any contribution from any other person or any other race. It's not the point, right? But like Frank said, and it, it's like we are the only race that has to prove our existence, that's to prove our blood count, you know. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted, to, I just wanted to make sure everybody's. I don't want anyone to think we're trying to, you know, steal anything from anybody. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I don't think it, it it comes across that way. I think it's a it's sort of a powerful reminder. You know, that that's the beauty of sort of the American music tradition is all of these these things interweaving and intertwining. And this seems to be sort of yeah. the invisible thread that is that is woven through a lot of that. And it's funny you bring up the shuffle and stuff because they say, and I should have been better prepared, I could tell you the Native American jazz drummer from the very, very early um even in the twenties, I think, early twenties, uh that they credit with doing that 
which is a Mohegan thing, right? It's a round dance. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is, is Mildred Bailey, who is an amazing, was an amazing jazz singer uh, who is indigenous and was the first woman to get her own radio show and her own television show. And who uh, Tony Bennett credits teaching him how to sing. He listened to Mildred Bailey's turn of a phrase, which was her native way of doing. When you, you, you turn those phrases up and you turn those notes, you know, um, and she would do the same thing with, with Western music, uh, with jazz standards. And she would, you know, and you can see that, th- that stuff happening in the blues as well. You know, it's there. You know, if you listen to Charlie Patton, you can hear when Charlie Patton was growing up and learning to play guitar, it was because the government made playing the drum illegal. It was against the law in the United States for an indigenous person, for a First Nations person to play the drum. It was against the law. And uh, so you can hear the rhythmic drumming of his guitar style on his guitar. You know, um, like Woody Guthrie's, you know, his guitar, this kills fascists. You know, it's like it was a weapon, you know, um, and a prayer. Of course, to us, you know, music is a prayer. Dance is a prayer, you know. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, call and response. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Call and response, something that we share with our uh, our African brothers. Um, what's funny, I, I refer to uh, traditional, it's so hard to, to determine what traditional music is anymore because there isn't anyone on the planet right now that hasn't been influenced by some other culture's music or art. So it's really hard to find those pure forms you know, but they're there. If you look hard enough, you, you research, they're there. Um, I call African uh, traditional uh, peoples and Native American traditional peoples uh, cultures of the drum, because unlike so many other cultures, our first music experience was percussive from the drum, right? We're not the only ones, but um, unlike, you know, Everything being note based or chord based, you know, uh, is more rhythmic based. You see, but what's funny is that the length and of the I think um, oh, I, might, I always confuse this. Thea, maybe you can help me. It's like the native call and response is that the 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 call is long. No, the call is short and the response is long. Where the African call and response, it's the other way around, and both independently developed without any of those two cultures ever seeing or meeting each other. Does that tie back to the fact that their birth of music or expression is on a drum with many people sitting around it, you know, with its spiritual connection? Um, maybe that's what I'm, I'm trying to find out. That's what I'm trying to, to prove, you know? Yeah. Jump in there, Thea. Well, I think this is a wonderful exploration of uh, that uh, that you're that you're doing with this documentary, and it's helping to really kind of uh, bring together a lot of una- uh, answer a lot of unanswered questions, and also give recognition to uh, to all to the to a, to an un- un- a yet unexplored history to some to some degree, and so um, I. Uh, you know, I I think this is it's wonderful what what you what you what you're doing with this. You know, and um, you know, um, my personal experience. I came into music through the Western culture, really. I mean, that's really where what I grew up listening to, and um, it's been more of a directed study for me over the last few years. Basically, uh, since I decided that this was something that I needed to give expression to. Um, and, um, so that's what, you know, that's, for me, this is a a journey that I'm just starting on in many ways, you know, and, uh, exploring Wampanoag history, 
Um, you know, I'm writing uh, some songs that are about Wampanoag legends. One of the songs that I wrote recently is about Moshup the Giant, which is part of the kind of, you know, origin origin tale of uh, the Wampanoags and how, you know, Martha's Vineyard or Noape came to be formed. And so I'm in the midst of exploring this. It's really kind of a reclamation. And that's really, I feel what you're talking about in this. It's a reclamation of a history, which you generally within indigenous and non-indigenous culture, you're taught to dismiss, you're taught to erase, you're taught to ignore, you're taught to diminish. So it's very powerful, I think, what's what, what's being done here with this. So it's great. And it's, uh, I'm excited about being part of it. So. Yeah. She doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to drag her around the country as a, with me. I'll, I'll be with you. I'll be there with you. Go to the other reservations. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the plan is to go and visit all these other reservations, but we want to make sure it's at a time when it's safe, obviously. Of course. Uh, yeah. of several course. nations got really hit heavy with the, the COVID thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Valerie, had you done um, had had this been an interest of yours prior prior to this? Um, I, I'm I'm not super familiar with your your background, but I'm curious: is it through your friendship with Dan that that you became involved with the project, or was there some previous roots? Um, interestingly enough, um, <clears throat> when Dan first talked to me about this project, I ran into him on the bus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always like to say, you know, it's a big city, but it's a small town, really. And um, I studied music. I went to university for music. So so I have a love of, of a lot of different types of music. And, um, you know, when he started talking about, about what he was doing, it really piqued my interest. And I loved the way that he was taking and, and, and tying the roots of, of the music together. You know, um, and I and I knew for me that this was something that I certainly needed to learn more about, you know, um, about this history and about how the cultures, you know, have shared knowingly or unknowingly, um, you know, not only music, but foods, language. Um, and, and it, you know, from my point of view, it's like, we have more similarities than we do differences. We just need to, to learn that we have them. And, and so when he approached me about this and I was listening to him, um, I was all in, you know, I, I wanted to learn more and I, I wanted to be a part of it. You know, I, I wanted to see, I wanted to see um, how I could contribute in some way and what I could learn from it. And certainly, you know, I've had the you know, opportunity to meet Thea and, and listen to her music and her stories and everyone else that was also part of the teaser. Because I find, you know, everybody has a story, you know, and a lot of stories are very interesting to hear. And, and I love taking those stories and, and, you know, capturing them and speaking about them. So that, that's kind of how the whole thing happened for me. I mean, I've shot a lot of different types um, of stuff before. I've, I've shot musicians before, you know, I've shot uh, music videos before, you know, I've shot little documentaries before promos. So I, I like to experience a lot of different things. I don't like to just limit myself to one particular thing. Um, because I always feel that when I, when I shoot that I learn so much about a lot of different people. And that's what really excites me and energizes me when I do my work is the story behind it. So, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I do have to give a shout out to another filmmaker friend of ours who shot the uh, segment with Frank and I, Daniel Frey, who's another filmmaker, local guy, who lives in our building. Um, but um, what a building you guys have! I know we have a lot of we have a lot of creative people down in these parts. Come over and visit, Nick. I will next time I'm in town. I have to. I mean, it, it is the Lower East Side. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, there there was something in what you said, Valerie, about uh, you know learning about about like learning through experiencing. Um, it's funny in, in making that joke, I forgot exactly what you said, but but I'm bringing it back around to this point of um, porch stomp. Just to bring it back to our community, porch stomp is is 
a wonderful group of folks um, that are all about expanding the understanding of what folk music is. Obviously, it's there's this thing that's happened that folk music is a person who looks a certain way, plays a certain instrument, and has a certain perspective. And I, I, I just want to, you know, maybe there are resources, maybe it's a way of looking at the world. And I'm just curious what what you can offer to this community. Is it is there a place where they can go to understand indigenous music in New York? Um, are there are there people? Are there names? This is a very open ended prompt, but uh, you know, Dan, if you if you would like to start on that, and, you know. Well, I mean, I I, I love that. I love that. Uh, it's like a, a, a mission statement for a poor stop. I mean, folk music, uh, what we understand it to be today is what it was marketed to us, commercialized. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, folk music is the music of folks. I mean, the, the music of, of people. If you translate most of what uh, indigenous tribes uh, call themselves, loosely, most of them translate as the people. Basically, we, we call ourselves the people. It's who we are, the people. And folk music is music from the people, you know. Um, there uh, have been several uh, inspirational uh, discoveries at, at the very beginning of this of this this uh, journey. And one, two that I have to mention are, of course, um, John Trudell, who was like one of my heroes, uh, who I was blessed enough to meet. And my friend Elaine, who's an Apache, actually, we went to this event down at the, Amer the Museum of the Native American down by Bowling Green. Um, and uh, it was uh, music from indigenous people all over, all over the United States, right? From different areas of just the United States. And John was there and he did a poetry reading. And then uh, behind the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, that tent where they serve coffee and donuts, whatever that tent is called, the uh, hospitality tent, right? <laughs> uh, uh, John was holding court and meeting some people. And, you know, I had uh, emailed him and we had some light discussions. But I didn't want to go back there because I felt silly because it was like, oh, everybody's online. I want to go see John Trudell, blah, 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 you know. And I uh, I get a text on my, my Indian phone. You people might know it more uh, commercially as the iPhone um, um, from my Apache friend Elaine. And she says, get back here now and see John because you just have to do this. And I did. And we took a couple pictures together and we talked, but he was such a, an inspiration to me because he, I felt like he was fearless. I felt like he could speak the truth in front of thousands of people who, would re who, who could easily physically harm him, but without ever looking like he was afraid and always looking like, I'm going to lay this on you and you're going to be right on my side because you know it's the truth, you know? Um, and also I knew of him because he, with one of my favorite in, uh, Native American guitar players, Jesse Ed Davis, um, wow. uh, w was in a band with him uh, where John would read his poetry and Jesse Ed and the musicians would play behind him. Uh, to some people who don't know who Jesse Ed Davis is, if you are old like me and remember an artist named Jackson Brown, Jackson Brown had a song called Doctor My Eyes and that guitar solo is Jesse Ed Davis. Uh, one take. Uh, which he, he didn't like and wanted to redo. And Jackson Brown said, no. And it's an iconic solo. I mean, you hear people hum it and whistle it, you know. But that's like most of us, you know. Let me tell you, I can do it better. No, one more. I can do it better. Um, another one is a woman from the Apollo, uh, the Apollo, the uh, um, uh, Pueblo people out by the Four Corners. Her name is Roxanne Swetzel. Um, and she is a sculptress. But what she did that really blew me away is that she found that a lot of the people in her community were suffering from obesity and from um, uh, arthritis and um, diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure. And she herself was suffering from high blood pressure. And she came up with this notion of like, 
let's eat what our traditional foods were. And they went back to eating just what their traditional foods were, maize and, and, and things that they gathered from the desert. So they stopped eating um, processed, you know, grocery store food. They, uh, she organized the community. They all got uh, uh, medical physical exams before her project started. And then I think it was six months, so I may be wrong about this, three to six months later, uh, after following just their traditional foods, um, half of the people, their blood pressure was normal. People were out exercising. They lost weight. Their obesity was down. The heart disease was better. I mean, their bodies were reacting to their native foods, you know? And I thought, wow, what about... If we, because because I hear so many stories about young people on the res now who are not interested in their traditional uh, music or their traditional making the regalia uh, for the dancers, making the drums. Very few uh, are interested in doing that. Um, it's brought us a lot of really cool Native American hip hop bands, but uh, like Res Dogs. Um, but, uh, the elders fear that these very special things are going to go away. And we have to realize that, um, they have a magic, their medicine, you know, there's a medicine there. Music is magic. There's a reason why organized governments and organized religions and sports events use music because it is powerful. It moves you. It gets into what we are as human beings and makes us react. And we have the choice and the responsibility to control our rhetoric through music, to move and to change things the way we feel that uh, we want to impact um, other other living beings. Um, it's very true. You know, yeah. and it happens. It happens to animals. It happens to plants. I remember in the '70s reading, you know, uh, these reports about guys playing music to plants and the plants reacted yeah. to them. You know, yeah. Yeah. music is so powerful. It's medicine. It's why indigenous people refer to it as a prayer mm -hmm. because they realize that magic. They feel that magic. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think all tribal people do. It's not just, it's not unique to us, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I want to I want to launch off that to one more thing because we are ending uh, sort of our time here tonight, and I, I just want to know like what are some of the ways that you know the Portsmouth community and anyone who might be tuning in the, as I as I think I mentioned to all of y'all certainly, but this will sort of live on on sort of the various Portsmouth media accounts. Like, what are the ways in which people can support? you know, native musicians, you know, what are the resources to, to find artists, you know, are, like, are, are there oh, some no. things out there? But well, obviously, I'm just curious if there's like, you know, if if there are things that we should know about right off the bat, they're like, this is a good place to, to go and support. And it's a so such a long list. There are organizations, Thea can help you probably answer this better than I. But I mean, you could join their fan Thea's fan base and you'll get turned on to others. Uh, Martha Redbone is also great. Um, Pura Fay, who now I think still lives in Canada, an amazing blues guitar singer. Uh, she used to be part of a band called You La Lee. She's in the movie um, Rumble. Um, very talented lady. I mean, you can uh, look these people up, but I think if you start to join um, you know, Facebook groups or or fan bases like people like Thea, you'll get exposed to more um, uh, events and, and other artists and so forth. But uh, uh, Thea, you, maybe you can contribute. Oh, sure. Um, if people Google, for instance, uh, Indigenous Music Awards, it'll take you to Indigenous artists in the United States and Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Um you know, Native Arts and Culture Foundation, NACF.org is a wonderful place to, um, you know, organization to check out. Uh, the Western Arts Alliance um, really has been tr tremendously supportive of Indigenous artists. I'm um, a two, 2019 um, Western Arts Alliance uh, fellow. I was, you know, Native Launchpad artist. So they've been very supportive. I think that there is a 
there's there's a there's a widening interest in investment in uh, indigenous artists and uh, you know right now and an awareness that's growing. So it's great that. It's great that you're having this conversation tonight, Nick, and um, you know, helping to helping to open things up. You know, it's it's great, and so um, yeah. So Google Indigenous music, and lots lots of lots of folks will come up. There's there's so many. You know, there's so many. Awesome. That that's incredible. Well, we are just about out of time. I need to take a minute and spe say a special thank you, Dan. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, Valerie, for being here. Um, Thea and Valerie have their uh, websites on there. They, you should see them. I see them. <laughs> uh, please find them. Support their music. Keep an eye out um, at the Porch Stomp page. Once you know more ha more happens with Dan's documentary, like this thing will be, you know, we will make sure to share it, and you will know about it, know how you can see it in full. Um, I would be amiss uh, just before we go without saying that Porch Stomp is June 26th on Governor's Island in person event, social distanced, safe, mm -hmm. outdoors, all of these things. We're going to do it as best as we can and make sure people is, are as safe as possible. And um, I think with that, we're going to call it a night. Thank you guys so much for being here. Really, it was Thank an you. absolute Thank you, Nick. pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you yep. very much. Yeah.